Hello and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network and the Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you so much for being here today, January 23rd, 2017, for our UNC Cancer Network North Carolina Community College Lecture. If you uh, are experiencing any problems at all with the connection, you can email us at unccn at unc.edu. You can call or text us at 919-445-1000. Uh, we'll be using Poll Everywhere, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. And you can uh, answer our polls and then uh, send us in questions at the end of the lecture. Be thinking about those questions throughout the lecture, and you can even, uh, anytime you want to start texting those in, we'll start those queuing up so that uh, we can share those with our presenter today. Uh, you can check us out on the web at unccn.org, and there you can find out lots of information about all of our upcoming lectures for this series and our other series, as well as find a library of over 150 past lectures all oncology related. You can uh, find us on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. Uh, lots of places to find out more. All right. I mentioned that poll and poll everywhere. And this is the question we're asking to, to start things off. And we hope whether you're sitting uh, at, at home or in your office or in a classroom that you'll pull out a, a phone if you have one available. You can also do this from a computer and uh, answer the question. The question is approximately 50% of all cancers can be, pre can be prevented with the adoption of a healthy lifestyle. So what do you think about that? True, A. False, B. And the way you let us know that is you're uh, on the web. You can go to pollev.com forward slash unccn, and you'll be able to interact with us there. Tell us what you think. If you've got a, a phone that texts, you just text the letters unccn to the number 22333. That is, you'll you put in 22333 as the, as the number you're going to text to, and then the letters UNCCN, you'll text those letters to that number. Uh, and you just do that once, and that joins you to poll everywhere. After you do that, you can just let us know A for true, B for false, and we'll see in just a minute here the uh, your answer, along with all the answers of the others watching, to this poll question. Again, approximately 50% of all cancers can be prevented with the adoption of a healthy lifestyle. A, true, B, false. All right. We are so fortunate to have Meredith Moyers with us here today. She's an oncology dietitian with the Comprehensive Cancer Center Support Program at the, at the North Carolina Cancer Hospital in Chapel Hill. In this role, Meredith counsels patients to come up with indi an individualized uh, eating plan specific to their needs. She works with patients undergoing surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy, and is familiar with the nutritional side effects of each treatment option. Let's take a look at that poll that I mentioned and see what kinds of responses we're getting here. Uh, bear with me for just a minute, and this should pop up. And there we go. So we've got 100% of our participants saying true so far. Uh, we'll give them another minute to see. Uh, uh, oh, it went down to 95%, so we've got at least one false now. While you're getting those answers in, uh, Meredith, welcome. We're so Thank glad you. to have you here. Tell, tell us what uh, drew you to nutrition and, and to, to a career in nutrition. Um, I'm really fascinated by um, how nutrition can heal the body. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I enjoy um, oncology nutrition because it's something that um, as patients go, go throughout treatment, nutrition is the one thing that they can have control over. So much part of oncology nutrition or oncology itself, mm -hmm. um, patients can't control. Right. And nutrition is the one thing that they have power of. So I like that I'm able to, you know, counsel patients and help them um, learn the best things that they can do to fuel their body through food. That's a great reason to be involved with this. And, and how long have you been in this field? Um, nine years I've been mm -hmm. a dietitian, and four years I've been in oncology. Great. And what, what was your education uh, path to, to get to your current role? So I have a bachelor's degree in the science of nutrition. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, you have to get a dietetic internship. Um, that they can be competitive and you get matched much like how physicians are matched to their residency programs. Okay. 
complete that, and then I did um, my master's in nutrition as well. Okay, very good. Well, uh, we've probably given our poll as much time as, as we can today. We've got uh, 83% of our uh, listeners saying true and 17 false. What's the answer? It's true. It's true. 50%, 50%. can um, be prevented with healthy lifestyle. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the whole reason that, that we're here, our program in North Carolina, is because cancer is the leading cause of death in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And, and our, uh, through the UCRF funds, the state has, has supported this program. So that's, that's pretty, pretty remarkable, mm -hmm. 50%. All right. Uh, with that, we'll turn this over to you for the role of nutrition in cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship. Okay. And I'll pass the uh, keyboard and mouse your way. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's dive in. I have a lot of material. So, the importance of nutrition during treatment. I like to make the analogy of a car needing gasoline. Your car can't go anywhere if you don't put gas in the tank. And the same thing is true with nutrition and treatment. You're not going to have the most successful outcomes during your cancer treatment if you're not fueling your body properly, which is why nutrition is such an important role. It provides maintenance of adequate nutrient stores and muscle mass, gives you strength and energy. It helps management of side effects, which we're going to go over, improves quality of life, fewer complications, infections, and hospitalization, which also can equate to um, not as much money spent on health care as well, and preventing treatment breaks, and improved survival and outcome. So the most common thing I have um, in terms of my practice is getting referrals from physicians for weight loss. And actually, 40% of patients experience some sort of weight loss prior to them even being diagnosed. And even more alarming is 80% of upper GI cancer patients and 60% of lung cancer patients already have had significant weight loss before they are even diagnosed with cancer. And why is this a problem? Well, because 40 to 80% of patients experience even more weight loss and malnutrition during their treatment. So if someone has already lost a significant amount of weight prior to diagnosis and then continues to lose during their treatment, that can result in really poor outcomes. And as little as 6% weight loss can predict a reduced response to treatment, reduced survival, and a reduced quality of life. According to ASPEN, which is the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, um, they came up with a list of criteria that can um, classify someone as being malnourished. And per their guidelines, as little as 5% weight loss in just a month um, is considered severe malnutrition. And so for someone who is, you know, maybe older in their 80s, female, they might weigh just 130 pounds. 5% weight loss is only 6.5 pounds, which is not a lot for someone who perhaps isn't having an appetite or they're nauseous and not eating. And so very quickly, someone can become malnourished during treatment. In one study, 13% of renal cell cancer patients had dose reductions, meaning their chemo was reduced. They're not getting as their full strength. And 21% had treatment termination due to losing weight. They stopped their chemo altogether. Body weight and lean body mass are considered risk factors for chemotherapy tolerance and survival in gastric cancer specifically. And toxicity from radiation can lead to unplanned treatment breaks that result in lower local regional control and survival rates in patients with head and neck cancer. And actually, as little as... Um, or I'm sorry, in head and neck cancer patients, tumor control rate is reduced 1% for every day that their treatment's put on hold. And sometimes patients, they start losing weight or they're having bad side effects where they might get a treatment break for a whole week. So that's five days they're missing treatment. So that's 5% their um, tumor is less being controlled. So here is a good graph to show you the prevalence of malnutrition in different types of cancers, starting from the top being the most prevalent of malnutrition down to the bottom. And pancreatic is very high, up to 80, 85%, then down to stomach, head and neck. And, and some of these th things you can kind of understand why they might have a high prevalence, but we're going to go further in depth. 
So what makes someone lose weight or become malnourished during treatment? Well, certainly some of their treatments themselves are going to cause problems. So this is a good graph that shows you the different kinds of treatments, chemo, radiation, surgery, and immunotherapy, and then the different side effects that they can have on a person. So if you look at the top from weight loss, fatigue, nausea, mouth sores, taste changes, constipation, chemotherapy can wipe all that out. You can have a problem in every category just from chemo alone. And actually, in one study, 62% of patients were experiencing more than one symptom prior to the start of treatment. Prior to the start. So that means someone might have already had weight loss prior to starting chemotherapy, and then they start chemotherapy, and now they have fatigue, nausea, and vomiting, oral mucositis, taste changes. That's going to really significantly impact someone's ability to eat, thus resulting in malnutrition. Now, treatment itself isn't the only cause of malnutrition and weight loss. Certainly, there are other reasons. Um, actually, sometimes people become scared to eat. They think that certain foods are going to cause their cancer to grow, and so they become too scared to eat at all. Or um, the financial burden of cancer and treatment alone can take a toll on someone. Perhaps they're not able to work anymore, and that loss of income you know, it has now caused strain on the ability to buy groceries, and so they're not eating as much as they used to. Or even the type of cancer itself. Uh, pancreatic cancer can lead to malabsorption or um, head and neck cancer patients. If you have a tumor growing right here, it can make swallowing difficult. Or if you had a tumor in your stomach, that's taking up your whole space inside that you're feeling too full to eat. So this isn't an all-inclusive list, but it just shows you how treatment can lead to malnutrition, which is why um, registered dietitians are important. This shows you um, nutrition intervention with two different ways. So the diamonds on the graph represent a dietitian meeting with a patient during radiation once a week, and the squares represent a protein supplement, something like Ensure or Boost. And then the triangles are no intervention. And this shows you that while protein supplements and seeing a dietitian can eat, increase someone's calorie intake, eventually the, pro, or the protein supplement drop off, whereas the intervention with the dietitian remains steady. And then at the next one, this shows you the protein intake. Same thing. The diamonds are dietitians, and the squares are protein supplements. So you might think, well, gosh, the protein supplement did better at first than the dietitian. But then if you look, the protein supplements completely drop off, and the dietitian intervention remains steady. So why would that be? Well, because the protein supplements do not get to the root cause of the person's problem. So why is your patient not eating? Why are they um, not getting enough calories and protein in? That's something that a dietitian can figure out through talking and doing diet recalls, and we can figure out what the root cause is. Whereas just, you know, giving a blanket statement of you should drink two Ensures or two Boosts a day doesn't fix the underlying problem. Is the person nauseous? Are they having taste changes? Are they constipated that's preventing them from wanting to eat anymore? So if you can figure out the root cause, then you're going to do better in the long term than just prescribing some protein supplement. So speaking of which, let's start talking about some of the problems treatments can cause and result in someone's poor nutritional status. Probably the most common one is nausea and vomiting. And so here are some common tips that we like to give people that they can try on top of already taking their anti-emetic drugs. Ginger can be a natural remedy, and um, it can be in any form. So some people drink ginger tea, some like ginger ale, and just make sure that it's real ginger ale, not imitation flavor. Um, some people even get the gingin candies that you can suck on throughout the day. We also advise that they stay away from eating their favorite foods because eventually you're going to feel better, and when you go try to eat, that favorite food again, you're going to now associate it with not feeling so great and maybe you won't want to eat it anymore. So try to refrain from eating those favorite foods during times of nausea. You can also suck on any tart candies like lemon drops or um, Jolly Ranchers. 
Also, we say try to eat just cold or room temperature foods because hot foods have a lot of odor. And sometimes when you're nauseous and you smell in that odor, it makes you even sicker. So either eat cold room temperature foods or have someone else do the cooking and just stay out of the kitchen so you don't smell it. You can also try bland or dry foods. And um, I saw a study one time that was discussing the different types of um, macronutrients, so fat, protein, and carbohydrate. And they found that when someone eats a fatty food, the stomach starts contracting really, really fast like this. And so when you're nauseous and your stomach's contracting like this, it makes the nausea even worse. Whereas um, dry, bland things like crackers, carbohydrate foods, or, you know, um, toast, that kind of thing, it makes the stomach contract a lot slower. And so this doesn't exacerbate the nausea as much. You may also try doing small, frequent meals. Because when you sit down at a plate and it's this huge meal at dinner time and you're nauseous, it can be very overwhelming and just turn you off completely. Whereas eating just small little snacks, maybe six times a day, is much more manageable when you're not feeling so great. And then we also encourage to sip on calorie-containing liquids between meals. Water is always great, but it also doesn't have any calories. So if you're able in between meals to maybe sip on 100% fruit juice just to get, a, you know, 60 calories per cup, then that's better than having nothing at all. And then I put that picture of hummus um, at the top there because... This is a good snack for someone to have who's nauseous. This particular brand is ginger flavor, so that gives you your natural remedy right there. It's also bland. It doesn't have any smell to it. You eat it with dry pita chips, but it's still packed full of protein and calories, so it's good for you. Another common complaint is poor appetite, and sometimes there's nothing that's leading up to the poor appetite. It's not because they're nauseous. It's not because they have um, taste changes. It's just they've lost their hunger cues altogether. So again, eating six small meals might be better than trying to, you know, eat three big ones. Choose foods that already have a lot of calories in them, or if someone's eating something already and tolerating it, is there a way you can make it have more calories? I always think of milk. Um, a lot of people eat cereal for breakfast, and are they currently eating their cereal with skim milk? And if they are, are you able to swap their skim milk out for 2% or even whole milk? That way they can get more calories in. Um, or what about peanut butter? Peanut butter just in one tablespoon has 100 calories. And can they just lick a spoon once a day, or can you dip your apples in the peanut butter? Or what about yogurt? Do they eat yogurt every day at lunch? And are you able to swap it out for a full-fat yogurt or maybe a Greek yogurt just to get more calories and protein in something they're already eating? And then, of course, if all else fails, that's when you can fall back on your nutritional supplements like Ensure, Boost, Carnation Instant Breakfast, or even make your own. You could do a lot of homemade smoothies or homemade milkshakes that maybe um, are more palatable. Fatigue is also a common side effect of treatment, and cancer-related fatigue is unlike the type of fatigue you might have from not getting a good night's sleep or just being really active during the day. Cancer-related fatigue can't be napped away, meaning they can't just take a nap and wake up feeling refreshed. Really, the only way to combat it is light physical activity. Just go for a light walk, get those endorphins going, and help you feel good. And then just keep in mind that on the days that you are feeling well, that would be a good time to prepare frozen meals ahead of time. So maybe make a whole bunch of different meals, put them in some plastic containers, and freeze them. So the days when you're too tired to cook, you're able just to pull that meal out, thaw it, and microwave it, and you'll have a meal. Also, this is when their friends and family can come and help. It doesn't mean that they need to come all the time, but maybe this person knows that their week after treatment they're really tired, so that would be a good time friends and family can come drop off some meals that week after chemo. I also say convenience foods are completely fine during this time. You know, normally we don't endorse eating TV dinners or the pastoronis and spaghettios and things like that. But if it comes down to just making something as fast as you can and eating rather than eating nothing at all, go for it. Same thing with crock pots 
kind of a fix it and forget it type of meal. You can throw all the ingredients in there in the crock pot, set it for eight hours, and be done. Or, as always, you can always fall back on nutritional supplements if nothing else is working. Sometimes people can also have um, sore mouth or throat. This might be from their chemotherapy or if they're having radiation treatment for head and neck cancer. So this is when we would advise them to drink through a straw. That way, they're, whatever they're drinking can completely bypass their mouth altogether and not irritate those sores that they have. You should also make sure the patient isn't using a mouthwash that contains alcohol because that's just going to make their mouth sores burn more. And then I'm a big advocate to be proactive, not reactive. So before treatment even begins, it would be a good time for them to start swishing around and gargling baking soda, salt, and water. This toughens the lining of their mouth to hopefully prevent mouth sores from even popping through. It also is just good oral hygiene that can help keep the mouth free of mouth sores. Of course, it's not, um, you know, a cure-all, and they might still have some, but it's good to give it a shot. Also try soft foods like pureed fruits and veggies, cream soups, cooked cereals, scrambled eggs, yogurts, pudding. Um, and cold foods can be really soothing when they have a sore mouth. So you could try freezing grapes or melon balls or, you know, milkshake, sherbet, that kind of stuff. All good choices. Definitely avoid hot and spicy foods because that's going to irritate the mouth sores even more. And you may even think about um, fruits that are citrusy, like orange, can burn mouth sores. Then we have taste changes. Sometimes taste changes occur due to the many medications that they're on. So this is, again, when rinsing your mouth out with um, baking soda and salt and water is a good idea. Sometimes what happens is their taste buds die and they just sit on their tongue and that, you know, adds to the bad taste of the food. So right before a meal, we encourage patients to do this salt water rinse, just clean their mouth out, and then eat your meal, and hopefully it will taste good. Specifically, some people say that they have um, a metallic taste in their mouth. I had a patient one time say that every time she drank water, it tasted like she was drinking from a rusty pipe. But simply squeezing some lemon juice in, adding some really tart flavor, actually helped offset that awful metally taste. We would also tell her not to drink anything from a can like soda or eat any canned foods. Or don't eat off your metal silverware because that's just going to exacerbate that metallic taste that they're experiencing. You can also try sucking on hard candies or experiment with um, different herbs and spices. I think a lot of people um, kind of shy away from those fresh herbs that are in the, in the grocery store, and they just always, you know, go straight to garlic and salt and pepper, and that's kind of all they use. But there's a lot of other things out there that would be a good time to start experimenting with. And the fresher the food, the better, because the fresher the food has the um, more taste than things that are um, pre-prepared or old. And then if things are too salty, you can try adding a little pinch of sugar, or if things are too sweet, you can add a touch of salt, just to offset that taste. Now, diarrhea, unfortunately, that can another, be another um, common side effect, both from the chemo or from radiation, depending on where the radiation field is. The biggest concern I hear from patients is that they just don't want to eat because they're too scared they're going to have diarrhea after. So they'd rather just not eat anything at all than risk it. And that's not good. And also, patients can become dehydrated really fast. You lose a lot of fluids with diarrhea. So we encourage patients to drink at least one cup of water or any liquid, really, right after their bowel movement to replace the fluids that have been lost. It's also a good idea to go back to those six small meals because it reduces the load in your gut. So if you're trying to eat three big meals at one time or in a day, that big meal is a lot for your body to digest and process that could make the diarrhea worse. So it's much more manageable for your gut just to have a small meal and then doing that more frequently. Also avoid greasy, fried, spicy, sweet foods. Avoid caffeine and alcohol and sugar alcohols like sorbitol, xylitol, or mannitol that's found in um, different candies and gum because that can add to a lot of bloating and gas. They should also limit drinks 
and foods that can cause gas. So vegetables in the cabbage family. Um, I also think of onions and um, green peppers can cause it, broccoli, cauliflower, peas, dry beans, and carbonated beverages like soda. Now, sometimes people just can't give up that soda. So if they insist on still drinking it, you can tell them to pour it into a glass and then stir it around, and that helps lessen the bubbles. And then try having them eat foods high in pectin, like applesauce and bananas. Or there's that old diet back in the day called the BRAT diet, B-R-A-T, and it stands for bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. And when I say rice and toast, I mean white rice and white toast. You don't want to have foods that with fiber in it, like whole grain bread or brown rice, because you want to give the gut a break. So those four foods are just easy to digest, kind of um, alleviate some of the work on your gut, hopefully help the diarrhea resolve, and then the next day you can start incorporating foods back in. It's not a diet you can follow forever because it doesn't have the protein and all the vitamins and minerals, but for a short time to help alleviate diarrhea, they can try the BRAT diet. Now on the flip side, there's constipation. So a good idea is try to get that patient on a schedule by eating at the same time every day can also have them drink a hot beverage or eat hot cereal to stimulate a bowel movement. Um, even hot chocolate or hot water with a little lemon juice and honey. But it's important that they're drinking at least 64 ounces of liquid a day. Sometimes people are constipated just because they're not drinking enough and you need that fluid to help things move through your system. And then fiber too. You need the fiber to help um, get things moving through. So fruits and vegetables, even popcorn, dried beans, and then your brown rice, your whole grain breads and cereals, and then move. Sometimes patients spend too much time in bed or a chair, and just encouraging them to get up and walk helps also move things through. Now when I say eat more fiber, your goal is for them to have at least 25 grams of fiber a day. Now, if someone doesn't eat a lot of fiber, you don't want them to jump right in and eat that all at one time. So encourage them to try to increase their fiber amount by about 5 grams, just to prevent any bloating and uncomfortable feeling, with the eventual goal of going up to 25 grams a day. So that's some tips for cancer treatment and what you can do for your patients while they're actively going through treatment. But let's talk a little bit about cancer prevention. So the American Institute of Cancer Research, they came up with this three-pronged approach to preventing cancer. And they say cancer that's not, um, you know, as the result of genetics or um, chemical exposure, smoking, can be prevented just by weight, diet, and physical activity. So we're going to focus on weight and diet. One-third of cancer deaths are related to dietary factors or physical inactivity. And then this is where our poll question came in. Approximately 50% of all cancers could be prevented with the adoption of a healthy lifestyle, meaning reduction in alcohol, you're maintaining a healthy weight, you're physically active, and you're following a plant-based diet. Plant-based diet does not mean be vegetarian. It just means the majority of what you're eating in a day should come from a plant. This is the strength of evidence between nutrition and cancer. And you can see in the bold where it says convincing is the strongest link between nutrition and cancer. So down on the left-hand side, second from the bottom, it says obesity increases risk. And that's strongly associated with cancer of the rectum and colon, breast, prostate, and endometrial. And then down one is alcohol is strongly associated with increased risk of head and neck cancer. These are all things that we can prevent or teach our patients to prevent just by becoming a healthier weight and reducing their alcohol intake. On the American, or I'm sorry, on the um, American Cancer Society's website, they have the 2016 facts and figures for the top five cancer, new cancers found in the United States. So you can see out of the top five, four of them can be related to nutrition. And then furthermore, these are the estimated deaths from cancer in 2016, and all five can be related back to nutrition. 
So because of that, the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute of Cancer Research had an expert panel get together to come up with what patients and what well, people can do to prevent their cancer risk. And I'm going to go over a few of these. So their first one is body weight. Maintaining a healthy body weight throughout life may be the most important lifestyle factor to reduce cancer risk. Once your BMI is over 40, there is a 52% higher risk for cancer in men and a 62% risk for cancer in women. Now, sometimes BMI isn't an accurate indicator of someone's um, overall health because it really is just a measurement of height and weight. And if you think about someone like a bodybuilder, their BMI might be very big because their muscles um, cause them to weigh so much, but they're not considered overweight. So this is why they say you can also consider waist circumference as another marker. It's a measure of abdominal fatness, including both subcutaneous and metabolically active visceral fat stores. The American Institute of Cancer Research recommends waist circumference to be no more than 37 inches in men and 31 and a half inches in women. And the way to measure your waist circumference is to go right above your hip bone and then be level with your belly button. Even within the normal range of BMI, both large waist size and excessive adult weight gain are associated with unhealthy metabolic changes and increased risk of cancer. So for people who are already overweight or obese, there are benefits from even a modest reduction in weight. So that's when, as a dietitian, we can come in and we can talk about foods and drinks that regulate weight. So there's two kinds of food, low energy density and high energy density. And energy that word can be interchangeable with calories. So when I say low energy density, that's low calorie dense foods. So that's your foods that are high in water content and fiber, like vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. And then high calorie density foods are foods that are associated with high fat and added sugars, like oils, fats, chips, crackers, and cookies. I love this picture because it really goes to show you where your calories can come from. So on the left, that's um, about 1,600 calories, and on the right, it's also about 1,600 calories. But look how much more food you get on the right than the left for the same amount of calories. So and sometimes, you know, when people say they're on diets and they're just so hungry. Look how much food you really actually can get if you fill up on all those fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Now, not all high-energy dense foods should be avoided. Some oils and nuts and seeds provide important nutrients. You just have to keep in mind the portion size. I one time had a patient, she was um, a survivor from breast cancer, and she was trying to lose weight to be healthier. She was getting increasingly frustrated because every week she was still gaining weight. So by the time I met with her, she was really upset. So we went through her average diet recall, and... You know, everything she was eating sounded pretty healthy, but when we found out the portions, that's where the problem was. She was eating a lot of almonds. She had heard that almonds, which are, you know, a high-energy-dense food, but they are considered healthy, so she was eating a lot of them. And by a lot, I mean she ate the entire canister in one day, every day. So even though we say that's a healthy food, it's still all about portion control. And if you think about it, a thousand calories from Oreos is the same thing as a thousand calories from strawberries. At the end of the day, they both equal a thousand calories. So you just need to be more conscious of your portion control. This is a good picture to show you what um, low energy or low calorie foods can do in the stomach. On the right, which is the low energy density, fills up your stomach, helping you feel fuller longer. Whereas on the left, the oil, which is the same amount of calories, actually doesn't fill your stomach up as much. It's digested a lot faster, leaving you feeling still hungry and sooner. And Meredith, I apologize. I forgot to warn you, but we put a question in there, oh. another poll question. So go ahead and advance that, and okay. we'll, we'll let them... Uh, it'll pop up in a second here. So evidence supports the use of dietary supplements as an effective strategy to reduce cancer risk in all populations. So do you think dietary supplements are an effective strategy to reduce 
cancer risk in all populations. So if you would take a minute to, uh, if you think that's true, text A. If you think that's false, text B. And Meredith, I apologize. Uh, Alan added that in, and, and I had meant to remind you of that earlier. So um, we're springing this on Meredith okay. as well. That's okay. Text your answers. Uh, text those answers. Again, if you think that the dietary supplements, and uh, do you want to remind our our uh, audience dietary? They might, well, that would include that would everything, everything from taking a vitamin, a mineral, or mm-hmm. an herbal supplement. You know, anything that you find at a health food store. Or would that be recommended to reduce cancer risk? All right. And so you just text that. You don't need to do that whole, uh, once you've texted uh, UNCCN to the number 22333 once, you're set there. Um, and then for the rest of this lecture, you can just uh, text the questions or A or B. All right. Okay. They're coming in. Yeah. It's kind of fun to see it moving yeah. back and forth there. Uh, we've got uh, 21 percent true, 79, 73. Looks looks like uh, we're we're strongly favoring the false on this question. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you want to advance the slide and, yes. and let them know. Well, those who said false are correct. So the American Institute of Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund expert panel concluded that the overall body of evidence does not support the use of dietary supplements as an effective strategy to reduce cancer risk. Now, they do recognize that dietary supplements may be beneficial for specific populations, but for reasons not related to cancer. So that would be like, um, you know, calcium supplements for women for their bone health, or a lot of people are vitamin D deficient and could benefit from it. But overall, for cancer, it's always best to get it from your food rather than from a pill. And then furthermore, it says, Evidence indicates dietary supplements can actually be protective or can cause cancer. So for calcium supplements, they found that it could probably protect against colorectal cancer, but at levels above 1,500 milligrams actually have been linked to increased risk of prostate cancer. So because of these concerning facts, that's why we just say food first. If you're getting in your five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day, you're following the plant-based diet, then you're going to get all the protective um, vitamins and minerals and antioxidants you can from your food rather than spending your money on dietary supplements that have the potential to cause harm. So then that's why we should start talking about the plant-based diet. Plant foods are rich in phytochemicals, and phytochemicals are biological compounds that actually help fight cancer. They're also rich in vitamins and minerals that protect cancer. This is a good graph to show you the different types of foods, their phytochemicals or their antioxidants and um, what they're good in. So instead of maybe taking a vitamin C pill, it might be a good idea just to have a citrus fruit like an orange, a lemon, a grapefruit, a pie or a peach, and that will help inhibit tumor cell growth, detox- detoxify harmful substances. Um, it's also considered a low calorie food, so it's not going to cause any weight gain. So just go through this graph and you can see all the benefits that the, you know, nutrition rainbow can give you rather than getting it um, in pill form. The expert panel also made the recommendation to limit consumption of red meat. Now it's important to remember red meat is beef, pork, and lamb. A lot of people don't realize pork is actually a red meat. So the recommendation is to eat less than 18 ounces per week. And research has shown that the risk of colorectal cancer increases by 17% for every 100 grams of red meat consumed. And you should avoid consumption of processed meats, things like hot dogs, bacon, sausage, or a lot of lunch meats. Anything that's preserved by smoking or curing that has the addition of chemical preservatives. Because research has shown for that, risk of colorectal cancer increases by 18% for every 50 grams of processed meat consumed. Alcohol is always asked by patients um, whether or not they can have it. And the expert panel recommends trying to avoid it altogether because ethanol in alcoholic beverages is actually classified as a carcinogen, as well as acetaldehyde, which is the metabolized form of ethanol. Alcohol metabolism damages your DNA, it damages your tissues, causes inflammation, interacts with folate, 
and interferes with estrogen pathways, all things that can lead to cancer. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, but the American Heart Institution says, you know, wine is good for you, or men can have two glasses, no more than two alcoholic beverages a day, and women should have no more than one a day. But it's important to know that in terms of cancer, it's best to avoid it, regardless of what the American Heart Association says for your heart. But for cancer, it's something you should avoid. And alcohol can cause cancer of the head and neck and your colon, breast, and liver. A modest increase in breast cancer risk occurs even at intakes of the recommended maximum of one drink a day. Sodium is another part of the expert panel, and you should try to limit your consumption of salt and processed foods and aim for less than 2,400 milligrams of sodium a day. Rather than using sodium, try using more herbs and spices to enhance flavors and reduce the need for salt. Salt and salt-preserved foods have been linked to stomach cancer due to the damage of the lining of the stomach, which increases inflammation and potential for mutations. And this is a good picture because I think a lot of people actually have so many um, different of the, all these different spices in their cabinet that they really don't use. They might have bought it for one recipe and then never used it again. But now would be a good time to encourage your patients to kind of clean that pantry out and start experimenting in recipes rather than using salt. Okay, so we talked about um, strategies for cancer treatment. We talked about strategies for preventing cancer altogether, but what about your patients that are finishing up treatment and now they're looking towards the future as a survivorship and they want to know what should they do as a survivor in terms of nutrition? Well, first it's important to know that there's an er early survival period. So for the first 12 months after treatment, eating may still be difficult due to the persistent issues from treatment. They might still be having nausea or xerostomia or loss of dentition if they had a head and neck cancer, or a lot of times um, colon cancer patients are having radiation enter enteritis, which means they're still having profuse diarrhea. So during that time, efforts to reduce the therapy-related side effects should be your primary focus of nutrition intervention. So all those nutrition treatment intervention things that we talked about in the beginning of the lecture is what you're gonna focus on in this early survival period. Then after a patient's symptoms have improved and they're able to tolerate most foods again, that's when nutrition therapy can shift toward health promotion and cancer prevention. And actually, the recommendation for survivors is the same as cancer prevention. So everything I just discussed as um, the expert panel with terms of sodium, and alcohol, and red meat um, is what cancer survivors should be following. Now, often cancer survivors begin gaining weight as their symptoms improve in that first 12-month time period. And sometimes it's hard to get them to change their mindset. So while they're going through treatment, we often are telling them, you know, you're losing too much weight, eat whatever you want, eat your ice cream, your milkshakes, whatever. And sometimes it's hard to get them out of that practice once they're in the survivorship time. So just reminding them that, okay, you're eating well now, you're gaining weight, let's try to start focusing on what a well-rounded diet is. Because as you can remember, overweight and obesity increases their risk of disease recurrence or even developing a whole new type of cancer. So intentional weight loss post-treatment for overweight or obese survivors may reduce cancer recurrence and also their risk for other related conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension. And if current trends in obesity continue, a staggering 500,000 new obesity-related cancer cases can be diagnosed by 2030. So that is why it's so important we start teaching these survivors what healthy eating and physical activity can do for them. And then this is just a summary that you guys can look over um, of everything that we talked about. On the left is the recommendation from the expert panel. In the center, it talks about um, specifically that, that um, recommendation and then what it's protecting from. So things like um, maintaining your healthy weight by having a good waist circumference and a healthy BMI can protect you from colon cancer, pancreatic, 
and breast. Or being physically active can strengthen your immune system, keep your GI tract healthy, maintain your weight. Limiting your added sugars um, can avoid weight gain, which then reduces your cancer risk. Following your plant-based diet, specifically consuming five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day, can protect you from mouth cancer, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, lung cancer. It also contains vitamins and minerals, which strengthen your immune system, and the fiber increases gut transit time to reduce your risk of bone cancer. We talked about limiting your red meat to under 18 ounces a week and then trying to avoid processed meats altogether to reduce your risk of colon cancer and stomach cancer. Avoiding alcohol to prevent um, cancers of your mouth, liver, breast, stomach. Watching how much salt you have to be no more than 2,400 milligrams so that it doesn't damage the lining of your stomach. Not using supplements to protect against, um, against cancer. Um, we didn't discuss breastfeeding, but this is one that's from the expert panel. It says it's best for mothers to breastfeed exclusively up to six months because it has been found to protect moms from breast cancer and also protects babies from excess weight gain leading to obesity in adulthood. And then the last one there is just um, cancer survivors should follow the recommendations for cancer prevention, such as being physically active, maintaining a healthy weight, eating a balanced diet, all to prevent all to help prevent cancer recurrence. And then I just threw this slide in at the end just to give you guys an idea of what some portions look like. So when I say you should limit to 18 ounces of red meat, keep in mind that three ounces is about the size of a deck of cards. So essentially you could have six decks of cards in a week of red meat, and that's combined for all your beef, pork, and lamb. And then right under it is the um, example of sodium. So I told you you should try to limit to no more than 2,400 milligrams of sodium a day. And as you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, one teaspoon of salt already gives you 2,300 milligrams. So you're not too far off from that 2,400 milligram. So I always think of people who just immediately start salting their food. A lot of times they're dumping about a teaspoon of salt on there and they're already reaching their maximum for the day in just that one meal. And then the last one is your one drink equivalents. <clears throat> so as I said, you should try to avoid it altogether, but definitely women should limit to no more than one in a day and men two in a day. And this is what one a day for women would look like. A lot of times people drink wine and they don't realize that it's five ounces counts as their one drink and they fill those glasses up, and sometimes it can be two glasses or two and a half. So just keeping these portions in mind um, are always the best thing. And I think that's it, if anyone has questions. All right, Meredith, this is great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, let me just remind our, our viewers that you can go ahead and now start texting all sorts of questions to us at that poll everywhere. Uh, and what you do is if once you've texted UNCCN to the number 22333 one time, then and, and I think most of you have already done that to answer our other polls, then you can just start typing in your questions and uh, texting those to us. And we'll <coughs> see those in just a moment here. Uh, they'll show up on our screen. So while we're waiting for those questions to come in, uh, you know, one of the great things about this lecture is that it teaches people not only how to care for their patients, but also to care for mm -hmm. themselves. So yeah. there are a lot of benefits here. Tell me, um, what, what, what factors do you find make a difference in terms of changing the, the behaviors of your patients? Obviously, uh, you, you can tell your patients all sorts mm -hmm. of things, and I'm guessing that some of them will change their dietary habits and some will not. Yeah. Are there certain things that you can do as a, as a clinician that can really in, improve your message and get that mm -hmm. across in a way that it actually has That's a good question, yeah. I think a lot of times um, people kind of are like in the go big or go home mentality mm -hmm. where they want to change everything all at one time. Mm -hmm. And so my best advice is to encourage that patient to try to pick one thing that they know that they can fix and that they can stick to. And once they master that one change, mm -hmm. then add a second one on. Right. And start managing and controlling both of those. Don't just try to completely change your diet all at one time because it often doesn't stick. Right. So finding one that you know you can do, become successful at it before you move on to the next. Great. So baby steps, mm -hmm. working up to, to more significant changes. 
And uh, um, is there a particular, is there one step that you often would say is kind of the easiest for, for and obviously each patient's different, their needs are different, but are there, is, is there something that, that seems to often be the one you'd like to start with? Well, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised how many people drink soda. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just taking it in a lot of soda. Right. And if you think about it, one can of soda might be 250 calories. And if they're drinking that three times a day, mm -hmm. that's a lot of calories leading to weight gain. Right. So if they're even able just to reduce it to one soda a day, mm -hmm. or can they even go to diet soda, and they're eliminating all those calories without changing anything else in their diet, not mm -hmm. exercising, not changing their dinners, just getting rid of one soda. Yeah. can make a big difference. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. I, one of my colleagues and I were, were walking by the snack bar at the football stadium and noticing they have all the calorie counts. And then and then I saw your uh, slide with the you know two yeah. sets of plates, and one has just a few little foods there, yeah. and it has the same number of calories as all these plates of all these other foods. Yeah. And, and you start to realize, boy, it really does make sense to start to become aware of how yeah. many calories are in something, exactly. uh, like the sodas that you're talking mm -hmm. about. We have questions. Coming in. This is great. Uh, so, uh, first one, uh, where can we see the slides afterwards? I couldn't get my computer to where I could see the speaker and her slides at the same time. That's a great question. So, uh, I th I'm not sure they're posted yet, but at unccn.org, under events, if you go to, pa right now it's future events, but it will soon be past events, I'm going to go ahead and post the slides there, if that's all right yeah. with you. And so I'll make those available in the same place where you saw a link to live lecture and some other things. I'll make the slides available online with the other information about this presentation. And if for any reason you can't find this, uh, those slides, just email us at unccn uh, at unc.edu, and, and we'll be happy to send you the link as well. All right. What is the cancer correlation to consumption of refined sugar? Well, it's actually uh, indirectly mm -hmm. correlated. Um, refined sugar just has a lot of more calories in it, so the more refined sugar that you eat, the more calories you're taking in, which then leads to the obesity, and the obesity is what causes the risk of cancer. It's not necessarily gotcha. sugar alone. Gotcha. A lot of people um, are fearful of sugar, that sugar might feed cancer, which mm -hmm. really is not the case. Um, right. It's indirectly related. Okay, but that, but that notion of the, of the obesity then, mm -hmm. and, and, and there we do have the Yes, that's the problem, yeah. Right. All right, when I'm on the road, I find it hard to eat healthy food. I think this, that this person is not alone. I think most yeah. of us experience that. Do you have any recommendations when you can't uh, bring your own food? Well, actually, I've been a little bit impressed recently with mm -hmm. a lot of fast food places or even just restaurant foods. Mm -hmm. They really have started coming a long way with, um, giving alternatives. I mean, even McDonald's mm -hmm. gives the apple slices over French fries, or I think Wendy's does the mandarin oranges over French fries. Right. So that's always going to be a better option. Or choosing grilled chicken sandwiches over the fried chicken sandwiches, or mm -hmm. um, skipping the soda and just ask for water. Um, and then I always pack, whenever I'm on the road, I pack my own breakfast with me, which mm -hmm. is usually just some granola bars, or I even pack a little um, oatmeal, because all you need right there is just some water in a microwave that your hotel usually has, so you can heat up some microwave in your hotel room without having to go down to the continental breakfast and eat the bacon and all that stuff. Right, right. So I think just planning ahead or even um, going on the wherever you're going to eat at, the restaurant or the fast food place, going on their website ahead of time and checking their um, nutrition facts for their mm -hmm. different foods and just finding the one that's going to fit in your goal yep. would be the best bet. Yeah, that's great. Again, those calorie counts. Mm -hmm. I used to go down to Starbucks almost every day and yeah. have a mocha, and then I took a look up there and I went, wait, that's almost 500 calories yeah. for my one little coffee drink, and yeah. uh, cut that out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, those sorts of things can make a difference. Is there any benefit to increasing consumption of fish for reducing cancer risk? There is, actually. So the American Institute of Cancer Research actually promotes trying to eat fish twice a week, mm -hmm. and that just gives you the omega-3 fatty acids. And so the fattier the fish, the better. So salmon, tuna, mackerel are going to be your best choices. Um, and just making sure that you're not eating fried fish, of course. But, yeah, twice a week is the recommendation. Great. Um, does Himalayan or pink salt 
count differently than table salt? Well, uh, it's not going to be the same serving size. So like one teaspoon mm -hmm. I showed you was 2,300 milligrams, but one teaspoon for the Himalayan and pink, I don't have it memorized, uh -huh. but it's not going to be 2,300 milligrams. Okay. So um, you, will, you still have to follow the recommendations, but just the servings would be different. Gotcha. gotcha. Uh, we were instructed that the BRAT diet was no longer recommended for diarrhea. What are your thoughts? I don't think it's something that you should do, you know, if you're having diarrhea more than a day. Mm -hmm. It's something that just kind of gives your gut a break um, in conjunction with, of course, the different, like, um, emodiums and things like that. But you should definitely not be doing a lot of fiber. You shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. a lot of fatty, greasy things, all of which is the brat diet avoids. So I think following the brat diet for one day is completely fine. Right. It's not something I would recommend, though, for the long term. Okay. And then, and then I know even just, you know, they we're constantly getting new information today. Mm -hmm. I know there was a big splash in CNN and some other press about acrylamides uh, and burnt toast and yeah. burnt potatoes and yeah. trying to stay away from that and the mm -hmm. potential for increase with cancer risk. So yeah. maybe if you're going to do your brat diet, maybe keep that toast on the lighter yeah. side. <laughs> um, and again, that's, that, that's just uh, some, some breaking uh, or, or newer information mm -hmm. I think they're still looking into. Yeah. All right. Uh, these are great questions. We have a few minutes. If you've got other questions uh, you want to share with us, please do. We've got a couple of more minutes. I had a few. Um, what, what's the future of nutrition right now? Is it, is it uh, in terms of oncology? Are, are there new studies? Is there new information that we're waiting for? Where, where do you think this is going over the next few years? Well, I think nutrition really has come into mm -hmm. the forefront, especially for cancer, because they're finding a lot of links of, you know, do the pesticides in non-organic food cause cancer? Or does the ketogenic diet help with, you know, brain tumors? So there's a lot of research that's going on that's going to always be happening. So I think for now, at least, you know, nutrition is going to just keep skyrocketing through. Great. And I see even from when I first started nine years ago till now, the way I'm incorporated today is mm -hmm. a lot more than nine years ago. Gotcha. So, I so, think so you're seeing people utilizing your role, mm -hmm. other, other people within the cancer treatment arena. Yeah. Great. Especially with the obesity epidemic mm -hmm. and all the different diseases that obesity um, contributes to not just cancer but diabetes mm -hmm. and hypertension and stroke and cardiovascular disease yeah. so all of that comes down to nutrition so mm -hmm. I think the field is bright for for dietitians good good mm -hmm. is there one piece of advice you might uh, give and as our as our last uh, question coming from me here for for our audience and and students who are maybe considering a career in nutrition mm -hmm. is there one piece of parting advice you would give to them oh gosh what can I say? Well, the, the field, even though it's growing, it's very competitive. Mm -hmm. So just make sure that as a student, if you can do as much volunteering as you can or do extra um, nutrition-related clubs or, you know, your job, even just working in a restaurant and get some experience around the food industry can really help you stand out if you um, eventually are going to apply to your internship. Great. That's, mm -hmm. that's very sound advice. Yeah. We want to thank our audience uh, for being here today, and we, we really appreciate your time and attention and the great questions. Uh, we want to thank Meredith uh, for, for all that you do for thank patients you. and for taking the time to share your expertise with, with our audience today. Um, I just a few closing remarks. We want to thank the state of North Carolina for their generous support of the University Cancer Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank the North Carolina Community College System, uh, all of these organizations coming together as a team to make this possible. Uh, we want to specifically call out Renee Batts and Catherine Davis with the uh, North Carolina Community College System and all of the, uh, of the faculty at the various community colleges who were participating in, and bringing this across. We want to thank our team, Dr. Tom Shea, Mary King, Max Gaynor, Alan Brown, and Gene Sellers. All of those individuals make these lectures possible. Uh, we hope that you'll be at our next lecture, and that's on February 27th at 1 p.m., and that's Caring for the Patient with Prostate Cancer with Mary Dunn. 
And so uh, we hope that you'll be here for that. In the event that you miss one of these lectures or that you'd like to see it again or you'd like to tell a friend about it so that she or he can view it, you can go to our website, UNCCN. Uh, dot org, and there you'll find our video lecture library uh, with all of our lectures, including our community college series. We hope you'll visit there, find out about our upcoming lectures and all the other things that uh, happen at the UNC Cancer Network. All right. Thank you so thank much. You. Hope you have a great afternoon, and we hope to see you next month.